behind me is the Gallows and Hangman's Gulch. And the story here is that the town of Bannock, Montana was sort of a waypoint between the miners' trail as they made their way over to the gold mines in California. And there was a man here named Henry Plummer who was elected sheriff in 1863. And at the time, Montana wasn't actually a state yet, and Abe Lincoln was in the middle of the Civil War, so he had no real interest in the direct statehood of Montana. And so Plummer became the ultimate authority within the land, and he quickly formed in town a sort of panel of miners, or a coalition, a gang called the Innocents. And they would raid different places, different caravans, and steal their gold. And it's interesting that he was the sheriff, and yet he wrought so much havoc. And it's said that it started out with him killing a man for sleeping with his wife, and he sort of found that he loved killing, something seen in a lot of serial killers. And so as the leader of the Innocents, he probably killed over a hundred men. And some estimates are as high as, you know, several hundred men. But eventually the town caught up to him and hanged him from the gallows behind me. And they, over the years, hanged a good number of other people. And they were buried in a local area which was revealed in 1907 called Boot Hill. And some of those men include people like Boone Helm. But I believe actually Plummer was not buried in Boot, Boot Hill. He was buried somewhere out in the hills. And even the vigilantes, which came back in 1907 to reveal where they buried the people at Boot Hill, they didn't reveal the location of Plummer because he was such a hated man. And every year they re erect the gallows behind me because even though in the arid climate it would be able to stand all these years apart from souvenir hunters it's also kind of they need to erect them again to redo the hanging otherwise it would be unstable and it wouldn't be able to stand up I've made the drive back up to Virginia City, Montana to tell this story specifically of the Montana Vigilantes. And initially I kind of wanted to talk about them from the perspective of them being frontier justice, perhaps a force for good. But stories like the man buried beside me, Frank Parrish, kind of really made me think otherwise of them. Basically, Frank Parrish was in his early 20s when he started journeying over here from Tennessee. Along the way, he picked up a Native American wife, and he couldn't find any gold, so he decided to start work as a ranch hand. But during this period of time, he got frostbite on both of his hands and feet and was totally unable to work. However, his wife and he opened up a shop in town and made a very good living selling food to the miners. So when the Montana vigilantes came along, they accused him of being a member of Henry Plummer's gang, basically a gang of what they claimed were hundreds of road agents that were robbing pioneers and gold prospectors. And he said, of course, I'm innocent. But the Montana vigilantes used the idea that the gang was called the Innocents and that their catchphrase was, I'm innocent, conveniently saying that his confession of innocence was proof enough that he was guilty. So they went and they hanged him, and even though everybody in town knew that Frank Parrish was an innocent man, everybody was too afraid to stand up for him. And it was only later that year that an actual territorial judge came out to Montana and sort of usurped the authority from the Montana vigilantes, although their killings would continue until quite a few years later. recording brown brick at the end of the row of five road agents hanged on the same day in January of 1864 is the worn and faded headstone of Clubfoot George, and his story is one of an interesting criminal who was trying to reform. Basically, he was accused of running horses off of their property in Idaho, something that was basically just being a thorn in the side of the local ranchers. And to his credit, he actually turned himself in to authorities at the nearest camp, and they gave him a sentence of hard labor, and once that sentence was over, he decided to make a new name for himself by moving into one of the mining communities over at Alders Gulch, and he came to Virginia City. However, he was quickly accused of doing the same thing again, and as well as being a member of the road agents, as they would accuse anybody that they didn't like. And his work, who had initially said, he's a very good worker, and I don't see why he would do this, and I can't see it being in his personality to even be a sort of highwayman, 
they started taking a hands-off attitude because if you started making justification or attesting to the good character of these guys that the vigilantes were after, they would think that you were a road agent as well and then you might end up on the Boot Hill Cemetery. So when Clubfoot George realized that he would not get any clemency from these vigilantes, he simply asked them to pray for him. And they said, willingly, George, most willingly. And he passed his friend on the way out from the building and on the way up to this hill where he would be hanged. And all he said was, I'm gone, old fellow. Goodbye. And eventually, they dug his body up. It was in 1907 when an aging former vigilante came to town and thought that it would be proper to memorialize these guys. And they dug up the grave, and he remembered very well where Clubfoot George was buried. And they dug him up, and the first thing they did was they cut off his club foot. And that was displayed in the county courthouse for quite a few years before it made its way to a local museum. And this museum eventually, only a couple years ago, decided to finally cremate the foot on the request from the family and scatter the ashes over the hill. The most interesting and storied grave in this cemetery is that of Boone Helm, the Kentucky cannibal, and it's surrounded by stories of cannibalism and the Wild West frontier serial killers and highwaymen and even stories of Confederate gold lost in the hills of Montana. And so his story goes that he, he was born in Kentucky and his family moved out to the frontier border towns that were kind of restocking and resupplying the settlers as they made their way out west. And opening a business, the family made quite the reputation, which Helm single-handedly, or Boone Helm single-handedly destroyed. He was known for getting in fights all around town, and when the sheriff had put out kind of a call for his arrest, Boone Helm hopped on his horse, rode it into the courthouse, and destroyed the whole thing. And having a wife and kid, he would... You know, he was well known for bringing his horse into the house, destroying everything, and just beating the hell out of his wife almost on a daily basis. He was a real terrible person. So he decided to talk to his cousin, and he said, hey, gold has been discovered in Montana and in California. Why don't we go? And the, the proposition was, you know, for the California gold rush. And his cousin initially said, yeah, but he also probably realized that he couldn't tell Boone Helm no because he was a sociopath and he was very violent. So he tried to break it to him later as the date was approaching that he didn't want to go. And Boone Helm, without thinking for even a second, just plunged his bowie knife up to the hilt in his cousin's chest. And realizing that now the law was on his trail, he made his way over to California himself. However, his cousin's brothers were in hot pursuit, and not too far away, they captured him. And why they didn't just hang him right there, I will never know, because they should have, considering all the damage he later did. But they put him in a mental institution. And after some time in this institution, because he was a sociopath, he was able to mimic and imitate empathy, leading them to believe that he was a reformed man. And he made his way out west. And uh, basically, he made it to California in some respect, but there's no record of what he did there. There's no real record of any kind of money that he made. It's very likely that he did nothing but join gangs and commit crime the whole way. Civil War. I know a lot of this area was settled during the Civil War. You made, made friends with bringing bodies out here? What? Well, I think the town was right over in this valley. And along the way, there was a very famous incident where he and six other men who were highwaymen, they were robbers that were preying on the immigrant families and the gold miners going to California, they were trapped on a mountain surrounded by Native Americans who were hunting them in the winter just above Fort Hall, Idaho. And the cold weather conditions started killing a lot of them. And it's unknown whether or not they killed each other or whether or not Boone Helm killed him or the Native Americans killed him. All we know is that Boone Helm says by the end of it, it was him and one other man. 
and he said this other man was lagging behind as they were hiking out of there and eventually when he's out of sight Boonhelm hears a single gunshot ring out and rushes back to the aid of his friend a story which I don't believe at all I think that Boonhelm just shot him and he sees that he's dead so Boonhelm decides to butcher him and eat one leg right there but he wraps the other leg in a deer hide and makes his way down to a friendly Native American camp where he's discovered by another pioneer who is heading into Utah and at this point in time we should remember Boonhelm currently has on his body fourteen hundred dollars of gold bullion and coins something which he never reveals or gives even you know a penny to this old man who's helping him into Utah and Boonhelm was quite proud of the fact that he never even gave a single word of thanks to this old man. So, in Utah, he decides to make his way over to the gold fields of California. And when he's there, we have no record of him discovering any gold or striking it rich. Again, he probably just did criminal activities. And then he came up here to Montana to join the Henry Plummer gang. And in this respect, he was a feared individual. In fact, he told a lot of people that he had killed and eaten more people than he was proud to admit. And at the trial by the Montana vigilantes that killed the other four men, that surround me as well as other people who lie in unmarked graves in the cemetery he proved himself to be a coward he blamed all of this on his friend who was and it it should be remembered up until the trial it was his best friend in the whole world three-fingered jack you know my buddy Jack did it, it wasn't me, I'm an innocent man. And when they went to hang him, they asked him if he had any last words. And he looked over to his buddy Jack who was hanging, and he said, Kick away, old fellow, I'll be with you in hell in a minute. And then he said, Every man for his principles, long live Jeff Davis. And he kicked the chair out from his own feet, and he hanged. And it's said that he didn't really struggle, and he just smiled the whole time until he died. And this led to stories of there being Confederate gold in the hills around me. And over time, the story was embellished, saying that the Montana vigilantes were union men and that the men being hanged, uh, members of Henry Plummer's gang, were gathering gold for the Confederate cause, trying to spread it out west. In reality, Jack, or Boone Helm, rather, was just a psychopath, and he was a serial killer. And he more closely relates to just brutal serial killers, in my mind, than Western outlaws. And I think his story is fascinating, and he's arguably one of the most interesting Western characters I've ever heard of. It's kind of crazy how many Freemasons came out west. I mean, in Colorado, it seems like half of the cemeteries out there are just Freemasons. I think that symbol on that one right there, I'll show you in a second, I think that's kind of like a fraternal organization as well. It's the, uh, no, I thought that was the woodworkers of the world. Jack Gallagher buried beside me was the last man to be hanged before the infamous Boone Helm, a man who I consider to be probably one of the first and most brutal serial killers in the American frontier west. And basically Boone Helm went down as a coward, claiming that it was all Jack Gallagher. It was three-fingered Jack that did all of these killings and that poor Boone Helm wasn't the road agent. And Jack Gallagher was wearing his Union cavalry coat as he was executed, very proudly, I should add. And it was said by a lot of people later who want to amp these stories up and make it seem like a sort of civil war being fought over here, or an extension of the civil war in the Deep South. A lot of them claim that the last words of Boone Helm would seem to testify to the fact that these men were all Confederate agents, but they conveniently leave out the fact that men like Gallagher were wearing the cavalry uniform of the Union Army, as well as the fact that the community had a lot of Confederates as well as a lot of Union sympathies. So there was no Confederate road agent gang out here. Henry Plummer was not leading a section of the Confederate Army fighting under the banner of the Golden Circle. It was just minors and minor justice. Basically, it's a very well-known fact that Gallagher was a member of Henry Plummer's gang, and that as a part of this gang, he would go around town and around these local communities setting fire to barns and stores and people's homes that he didn't like. And once they were all buried up here, someone came and gathered their tombstones years later, which at the time were made of wood, and brought them to the local museum. However, shortly after, the museum burned down. And I've heard it said on so many Western blogs that 
that the burning up of his tombstone was a fitting end for an arsonist that brought nothing but trouble to communities out here in the West. Behind me are the graves of the five men hanged by the Montana Vigilantes in 1864, members of the Henry Plummer Gang, and this was a period only a few months before territorial judges arrived trying to end this period of minor courts and vigilante justice. However, there are other people buried around me that I think are very interesting slices of pioneer life. Uh, one of them is Ah Tong, who is buried to Confucius rites. He was apparently a Chinese man, and they left a bowl of rice with the two chopsticks in it and different offerings, a plate of pork and, you know, cigarettes and cigars. But I think a fascinating slice of uh, vigilante history is Charles Wilson, who was killed in 1863. And the newspaper kind of does a huge disservice to Charles Wilson. He's now buried in an unmarked grave, and we don't know where his body actually is. But the story goes that he was demobilized out of the militia company D. And after this period of time, it was hard for him to find a job. So he started taking to drinking. And uh, people generally had a bad you know, kind of idea of him in town, but nobody generally hated him. He wasn't really known as a career criminal, and he found odd jobs, but wasn't able to hold anything down. So in 1867, they find his body hanging from three kind of trees or small saplings that they had made a tripod out of, and his feet were just barely touching the grass, something that must have been agonizing. You know, he was struggling there for probably 15, 20 minutes, and they said, the newspapers that, you know, they were looking at it with flowery, rose-colored glasses, saying that the vigilantes just a few years prior would bring justice where nobody else would. Swift frontier justice. And then one line later it says, nobody really knows the crimes he was accused of, and nobody really thought of him as a particularly bad person, although he wasn't really well liked in town. And this is one of the last incidents of the Montana vigilantes before they were kind of driven off into the hills. However, different vigilante groups would arise wherever law wasn't able to cover properly the territory. One of the most famous being the wars in the open ranges a little bit to the east of here.